Happy New Year again. Happy That's New Year to you. There we go. Happy New Year to the listener. We're recording this on the 4th of January. Um, so I don't really know what 2023 is yet. I'm just tired, mostly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am. Um, it continues to be dark and it continues to be tired, but slightly less dark and et cetera, et cetera. Um, already, Dan, breaking climate records, I think, in um, Europe. And as we speak, there's like an obscene amount of rainfall coming towards California, breaking records there. It took roughly about four days for climate chaos to make the news again mm-hmm. in uh, what is what year is this now? 2023. Mm-hmm. So beginning as I think we've all expected it to, just with a little bit of crisis, a little bit of chaos. And Dan, dare I say, that leads us in to our episode today. Am I incorrect? <laughs> we we did have a discussion about um, crisis, <laughs> economic crisis mostly and um, the tendency for capitalism to break down. We had the great pleasure of speaking with Ted Reese, which I'm sure you all know because it will be in the thumbnail. And then, <laughs> um, uh, who, yeah, talked to us about Henry Grossman, but also like Marxist economics in general, and um, did a bit of like looking into the future um, of technology, of automation, um, discussing history and the prospects for socialist transition. So it's a it's a dense episode, fun fun filled. Um, yeah, had a great time uh, recording it. Would yeah, you? absolutely. Then look at us, our second interview in as many episodes, I believe, which is very <laughs> exciting. You always know why, you always can tell that Dan and I are actually trying to read a book when we have like interviews lined up because it's like, <laughs> we have a particularly long book that we're trying to get through right now. Yeah. So that's why, you know. If we, we try to read something interviews. long, we do an interview. And if we actually are struggling to read something long, we read Murray Butcher. Yeah. <laughs> or we watch an Errol Morris movie. Or we watch an Errol that's, Morris movie. Yeah. <laughs> so right now, new year, new us. We're, we're trying to do some good stuff. And you're right. This was an absolutely awesome conversation. Very enlightening um, with Ted Reese, who I'm sure most of you listening to this will probably know. He's been on a number of different lefty podcasts. Um, he's written a couple different books on the thought of Heinrich Grossman, who I was calling Heinrich Grossman in our last episode on him, which makes me feel like a real idiot, Dan. What a fool this guy is. Um, his, uh, his book, Socialism or Extinction, is the one that I've gotten read. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, incredibly depressing introduction, but well worth getting through. He's also written Humanizing Production and The End of Capitalism, The Thought of Heinrich Grossman. Um as Dan, as you've said, this we talked about a bunch of different things, everything from hemp to uh, the coming uh, final crisis of capitalism and what our current situation, crisis situation, could mean for all of that. So I think maybe and, without and the ongoing ado, war on permaculture, the ongoing war on permaculture, yeah. which, yeah, as we yeah. all know, Dan, permaculture and their false flags and their you know, goddamn, uh, I don't know, CIA connections. We've, com- we've complained about permaculture on the show before, but we've never done it <laughs> by claiming that they work for the CIA, which, uh, <laughs> which is a natural step it. for us, I feel. <laughs> it is. Yeah. yeah. Alan Dulles's garden. You should go see it. There are daffodils everywhere. Yeah. Um, Lots of not hand. daffodils, dandelions. Um, okay. So I think without further ado, we just get right into this one. If you want to know more about Ted or the work that he's doing or kick him a few um, dollary dudes, there'll be a link down in the description for all of that. And um, without further ado, Dan, happy new year. And Let's get to the interview. Let's do it. Ted Reese, welcome to the show. Welcome to the listeners. Um, I wanted to kick off with a question. I think of you as like somebody at the forefront of popularizing Henry Grossman and sort of reintroducing his work. Um, I wanted to ask like for a sort of like basic primer for us, but also something that um, our listeners can use maybe to popularize these ideas to other people, not necessarily Heinrich Grossman, but like I've done a lot of grappling with how to talk about the sort of tendency for the rate of profit to fall and how um, crisis manifests itself in capitalism and what Marx said about that. And, um, so I don't know what your your best way of introducing those ideas are um, in a language which is most accessible for people. Um, that would be great to hear. Yeah, so first and foremost, thanks very much for having me on. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a difficult question because there are there are obviously a lot of ways to approach it. Um, I mean, my if if I'm honest, I would just say read like read Grossman's um, the abridged version of of his book and read it at least twice, and you know, <laughs> read my stuff on on him as well, um, whether it's in my first book, Socialism or Extinction, or 
my last book, um, the thought of Henrik Grossman. But but you know the the gist of it, and obviously I'm trying to make it as um, understandable and accessible as possible, is that the the larger capital gets over time historically the harder it becomes to reproduce because when capital is accumulating um, you're not just adding a bit on top of what's already been accumulated so to speak you're reproducing the whole thing and so the key i think the i think the main contradiction in there that's probably the most easy to grasp is the fact that if you think about um, production, it's 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 a basic law of economics that any any um, economist from any sort of uh, tendency knows and accepts, <laughs> perhaps more importantly, that the more you produce in the same time, um, the each unit will get cheaper. So if you produce 10 in an hour, 10 commodities in an hour instead of five commodities in an hour, each commodity will be cheaper as a result. I think most people get that. So you've produced the same amount of value despite having produced more commodities. So that's the inherent contradiction within um, the commodity because the commodity is a use value, a utility, a useful thing. And it's also an exchange value. Uh, con it contains use value. And in Marxism, we talk about that exchange value ultimately representing time and, and labor time. And that, that labor time having been appropriated from uh, the workers who produced um, the commodities. Obviously, it's a lot more complicated than that when you start to scale things up. But if you can try and sort of just grasp that basic fundamental idea and then start extrapolating it, uh, start scaling it up. And I think it, it's the thing I've been saying is, you know, the more the more um, productive our capacity to produce commodity becomes, the more the exchange value side of the commodity tends to wither away. Because you're just you're just extrapolating that basic idea that the amount of exchange value in each commodity is withering away uh, in sort of relative terms, even if the absolute amount of exchange value we're producing is expanding or, or at least tending to expand. So I think that's one way of looking at it. Um, and Grossman did did look at it like that. He also talks about um, crisis when crises emerge specifically where we're talking about an over accumulation of capital so what he means there is that again the amount of value being produced isn't um, enough to reproduce the total amount of value that had been produced before um, so what you get is a, an underproduction of value relative to the total amount of capital value, which is the same thing as an overaccumulation of capital value relative to that that surplus value that's been produced. So we tend to get recessions every ten years, and that is usually the the uh, almost you know the vast amount of, of time. That is the underlying reason for the for any recession, and um, what that means for the capitalist class is that they have to rebalance that that problem. So you've got the underproduction of the surplus value and not enough of it to sort of reproduce this amount of capital value up over here. Sorry, I'm gesturing with my hands, and that's not going to be <laughs> useful for people <laughs> listening. Um, but yeah, so they have to bring they have to kind of bring down that capital that surplus of capital value by devaluing it and find ways to also um, bring up the amount of surplus value that's being produced and appropriated from the working class. So you need to produce more value and you need to appropriate more of that value from the working class um, to offset this over accumulation of capital. And then 
almost automatically really the more the more you produce the again the more you're devaluing the val- the capital value that already existed so that almost happens automatically just by expanding production uh whether that's through innovation or just sort of simple expansion does that does that ca- make sense in a uh, is that quite clear or <laughs> yeah no that's very clear i think um the next logical thing would be to ask about labor in that equation then i mean like there's that rebalancing you're talking about and um there's the i suppose the use of automation to make labor more productive i suppose as one side of balancing that equation um i guess then like uh to ask about the labor theory of value in general like that's very central to this right that's that's the main thing at fault is that uh sort of bourgeois economics if we're going to call it that doesn't see labor as the sole value producing part of this equation yeah Um, you can't get what what i've just explained on behalf of henrik grossman um without understand without this labor theory of value like that's his starting point um and and this is why you know any rejection of um the labor theory of value is going to result in an incorrect theory of economic crisis it strikes me as it's really surprising when a hero of marx is like not believing in the labor theory of value or um, yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> or looking to other things and i suppose that was happening all the way back to grossman's day i guess um yeah and all the way through yeah. yeah i mean one of the questions i was toying with asking you was kind of like why was it that grossman's ideas weren't accepted at the time when they were introduced i guess because like he published his his primary book on this text like a few months before the wall street crash i understand um, yeah but like the i guess the prevailing uh dogma of the left was very different to these ideas kind of thing um so i yeah. guess what yeah what were the ideas that were around then that were like prevented this from being recognized as being um, an important I mean, development so, of Marx. So, so the main one on the social democratic left was they sort of had this harm and what he, what Grossman called a neo harmonist um, theory of capital accumulation, whereby there was no inherent tendency towards crisis. Um, they did recognize that the rate of profit tended to fall but they basically said it could go on falling forever without, you know, disappearing completely. And so their reasons for crisis had to be external, um, caused by poor economic or governmental management, um, you know, wars, um, bad weather, bad, um, you know, um, um, what's the word? Harvest, like, yeah. Sorry. It's almost just like, accident, like that. Like, it's almost just like accident. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, it's not escaping idealism essentially. Um, and so, yeah, uncivil. Uh, uh, another big one they put down was um, uncivilized ruling. The the ruling class being uncivilized was Kautsky, something Kautsky came up with, which is you know a, a contributing factor. Don't get me wrong, um, but. So, yeah, so they, so Otto Bauer, who was an Austrian Marxist or, you know, left um, reformist social democrat, he sort of um, put together his economic theory, which showed that um, as long as uh, production was being properly organised in the right proportions in terms of, you know, dedicating the right amount of this commodity to this branch of industry and this commodity to this other branch of industry and so on and so forth in different sectors and um, different companies um, that there could be no problems like the the system would keep going you know as long as there was no bad weather and and a bad harvest or or a war or something like that then capital would keep accumulating and you could avoid um, a recession or a crisis so the the answer to that is reformism and a bit you know introducing a bit more central planning um in at the governmental level at the state level so social democracy is the the answer there the other um theory was under consumption which was i mean there's several shoot offs of this but the in the gist of it uh, of the main theory is that 
um, capitalists aren't paying their workers enough money or they're taxing them too highly or, you know, along those lines, meaning they can't buy the commodities in sufficient quantity that the capitalists are selling and therefore the capitalists don't sell enough of what the workers are producing and a crisis ensues. And therefore reformism is again the answer, raise wage, wages, uh, maybe lower the taxes on working class people, maybe uh, maybe raise taxes on, on the rich and everything's hunky-dory that there's no crisis. But actually these things can deepen um, the economic crisis because you're actually eating into profits and profit margins, which essentially means you're taking away the amount of value that can be dedicated to capital, the, the accumulation of capital value, which therefore um, exacerbates any over-accumulation of capital. Uh, so it can, it can exacerbate an existing crisis or it can bring forward the onset of the next one. Um, and on the labor theory of value, I mean, that's obviously a very complicated one to what to, to, to go through. But the thing I usually say is that, you know, that I point to is that all commodities have to have something in common for them to be exchangeable. And that, um, thing in common is abstract. It has to be abstract labor and abstract labor time. Like it can't be anything else. There's no, there's no, you can't say, oh, well, you can all exchange them through dollars. Like that's not, that's not because the dollar isn't a set thing. It's, it's a variable thing. Um, so if we can, if we can sort of take, take a step back and look at the thing, everything more broadly, th that's what makes them exchangeable um, in terms of them having exchange value and being able to exchange them with a third through a third um, universal commodity that being money so obviously i, f I mean obviously you're not going to you're not always going to get people to just accept that off the bat um, but there are there are lots of empirical studies now that show that the the more labor intensive um, a form of production the higher the rate of profit so the relative amount of profit being produced uh, the return on the initial investment it tends to be higher so i would for anyone listening there's there's studies by andrew Kleiman, um paul cockshot um there's a few others there's a there's an essay by michael um, roberts um about marx versus keynes and he lists in the footnotes he lists a, a bunch of studies that show this from there so it, it yeah and it all flows from there really so once once you've got that and you're you can see that what's going on is this theft of of surplus value which is essentially labor time that's not being kept by the worker but is instead going into the commodity and then being realized as profit by the capitalists then you can begin to see how a crisis might unfold because it becomes obvious that is if there's not enough value or there's not enough value being appropriated by um, the capitalists, then there can then the possibility of a crisis is, it exists. Yeah, I, I guess it's also like to me it feels really important also to keep in mind that like the only way to save capitalism, I suppose, is to extract more value from workers or to exploit them more. Yeah. or to increase automation kind of thing but those are tendencies which are going to make people's the lives of work the working class worse not better kind of thing so um yeah i mean there's there's always a dual movement i mean I, i'll come back to that because you you said about automation before so when there's a crisis like the capitalists is they need to restructure their their own companies and the and then in totality the economy as a whole so one of the ways is expanding production and as time goes on the way production tends to be expanded is through innovation because you need to raise the productivity of labor and you need to to see off your competition and so the the, the capitalists who can innovate first in whatever sector will um intensify the tendency towards crisis but they can't they can't avoid that because they need to beat their competition so this is why I talk 
I've recently, more recently than when I was writing my books, um, I, I've focused a lot on the evolutionary side of things because I see I see the, the sort of approach, what I see as a, an approaching or future um, socialist revolution as being the final phase of a series of evolutionary phases. Um, not that the revolution is then the final phase of all time, but just within that series of 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 historical phases and yeah like we're talking about the evolution of production from mechanization towards automation and that's been happening all the way through capitalism and we're now heading towards a very sort of acute point in that that um, process where the only way to kind because there's two things when you're automating you're that you're trying to do is trying to expand production both in terms of absolute quantity and the variation of commodities that you can produce so you can sell more uh but you're also trying to um reduce the absolute outlay on wages um because obviously that can improve your profit margins so both of those things can improve improve the profit margins in two in two directions um but then there's this inherent contradiction that you're getting rid of the source of profit, which is the commodity, the exploited commodity producing worker. Um, so obviously there's a lot, there's a lot of work that, that isn't commodity producing that um, when you automate it, that will actually improve your profit margins. Because if you can, if you can automate a job that doesn't produce surplus value because it's not producing commodities, then that's going to boost profit margins at least temporarily. Um, well, and and is, the automation that is happening, would you say that it is primarily happening in those kind of roles where it's non less um, value? No, or? no, I would say primarily it's happening in. I would say it's primarily happening in commodity production, but it is still happening in in non commodity producing roles. Although a lot of the time it just augments, obviously, as well in both cases. But I think particularly like just think of something like CCTV, um, like that doesn't mean you can do away with, you know, um, police who work on surveillance. But it augments. It does. But it does mean you can hire less police, which means you're spending less um, uh, money on police, which means you don't have to tax profits so much. Um but yes, something like CCTV will augment that and, you know, allow policing to be more efficient. Um, and there's all sorts of examples like that. But but when you look, I mean, I've got a friend who works for Amazon and he says 85 percent of the, the warehouse is automated. And that's not a particularly. Uh, I mean, there's there's some commodity production, there's some part of the commodity producing process in a company or in a warehouse like Amazon, because even, um, you know, even consumption is part of the, the, the production process. Like the point, the point of production, uh, sorry, the point of consumption is ultimately part of the, um, production process. So if you're automating till points and checkouts, um, with self self service, even there, you're you're getting rid of part of the surplus produ value producing working class, um, or with transport workers. Transport workers who um, transport commodities will add value to those commodities because they're being exploited. Um, but if we move towards something like self-driving cars and self-driving lorries then again, you're automating the last part of the production process. So even though that's a bit a bit off still, maybe a couple of decades or whatever, and stuff like the crisis, every crisis slows this pr process down for a while. Like there's a lot of um, articles you can read about how, you know, the, the self-driving car revolution is slowing down because of the supply chain crisis and all that stuff. Um, so this, but then there might come a, a sort of um, a point in the crisis where there's been enough devaluation to then speed up um, the, the, um, the rate of innovation again.
So, I mean, I, I kind of wanted to ask a little bit about that because Dan and I recently read um, Paul Maddox's essay on Grossman, The Permanent Crisis, and a lot oh, of emphasis yeah. is placed in that on this relationship between fixed and variable capital. And I was wondering if in Grossman's um, thinking or if in your own thinking, if that that relationship does necessarily have to become absolute in the sense that fixed capital always tends towards becoming one like the totality of the production process, if it actually does become 100%. Um, and the relationship that that plays into Grossman's thinking of capitalism, not just facing cyclical crises, right, but also like one ultimate final crisis, or if that's very vulgar. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't say it's very vulgar. I mean, <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. I didn't really mean that. Um, I, I've written that capitalism cannot complete the automation revolution. Uh, it has to be completed by socialism. Um, I think the system will break down before. Um, how long before? I don't know because again. If you sort of think it in evolutionary terms, like we're we're evolving towards a fully automated system of production, and is it a case of like we get ninety nine percent of the way there, and then the system just collapses? Yeah, well, surely there's no profit to be made. But it might, it yeah, exactly. I mean, like, logic logically, you would think it's probably a bit before ninety nine percent. But but again, I can't like. I can't tell you exactly how close we're going to get to it before yeah. either it breaks down or there's such an impetus from the working class. Cause, cause the thing is there's two, I think there's two sides to what's happening to the working class and both create a revolutionary situation. I think there's the, there's the part of the working class that's being made redundant because, um, either being made redundant or pushed into low productivity services work. Um, and and they, they are becoming less satisfied with um, life under capitalism and the, and the wages becoming more unattractive. But then there's the sort of, there's the sort of um, contemporary labor force that is being um, pushed into the more advanced forms of production in terms of data science, um, automation, like machine learning, you know, and those workers are going to play a vital role because they are going to, they, they have the education and the experience to operate the most contemporary forms of, of the means of production. So that you know, you, you can't um, expect people who don't know how to write an algorithm. You know, obviously, the mo the modern day economic technical base is is largely run by and operated by people who know who to, how to do those things. So, workers who who are being trained in the sort of latest forms of of production are going to play an absolutely vital role and and their wages are actually quite high they're relatively high because their education costs a lot to produce the equipment they need to buy um whether it's computers or, or other forms of equipment it's quite high and the, the capitalists can't really not pay them they can't it's harder for them to attack those those workers so when the crisis gets really deep and they start having to f find themselves having to attack that sort of layer of, of labor. I think that's when they're going to start finding them, that they're biting off more than they can chew. Um, because the, 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 the modern technical system, uh, the modern means, mo means and mode of production cannot operate without those workers. So I think you've, you've got that sort of um, relationship sort of, culminating gradually as as we move uh move forward yeah that that makes sense it's, it's interesting i never really thought of actually that strata of the working class as having kind of that much power but i mean when you really read about like the way that amazon just their delivery routes operate and the necessary like algorithms that have to be written to like perfectly plan out every single stop and things yeah, like that exactly. it is pretty stunning um yeah. But yeah, also, also just going back to the idea of the final crisis, I mean, 
surely like if it ever were, even if things were trending, say, just for the sake of argument towards like a totality of like complete automation, that would require capitalists to just completely dissolve themselves, right? Like entirely as it would require like the mode of production to kind of dissolve itself because then yeah, you can no longer yeah. base anything on um, abstract labor, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when, when you get, if you abstract to fully automated production, there's no surplus value being produced. There's, there's two ways of looking at it. You can say there's no value being produced at all. And it's just now, instead of being a labor uh, or a value valorization or value producing process and a technical process, it's now just a technical process. That's, and that's kind of, that's what we're heading towards. So but then you can say that lo- you could say that lower. I mean, there's a there's an argument about whether lower communism produces value or not. It certainly doesn't produce surplus value. But there's still this debate about um, because we we would we would still pay people according to the amount of time they work, and in and we would we would kind of pay them in vouchers if you want to call them labor credits or labor vouchers and you know this would be measured in according to how much time they worked and weighted against their productivity rates and that sort of thing and there's so there's this debate about whether that counts as, as value or whether it's just an accounting tool i'm not that bothered <laughs> whether it is or not to be honest um i don't think it's that big a deal um Certainly, there's you know a continuation. Uh, there's some continuation from what from the wage system, and in that sense, you could look at it as value. But it's certainly not surplus value. It's certainly not because all the money, all not all the money, all the value that is then being produced, whether you want to call it value or just an accounting measure, is going back. Is it's all socially owned. It's all socially owned. So it's not none of none of it is being appropriated into into private property or private um assets yeah well then just just again one one last thing on this idea of the final crisis because it is so um ingrained like well that's kind of what people think about when they think about grossman right i was wondering other than trending towards perhaps a collapse of the capitalist system or an evolution of the capitalist system in what other ways is capitalist production becoming a fetter to um production in general the capitalist social relations becoming a fetter to production in general other than the ways that it always has been in terms of a large percentage of the population always going to bed hungry yeah so um so ultimately we're heading for like what i'd call an absolute over accumulation of capital where there's so little value being produced relative to the over accumulation of capital that it, that's when it collapses I mean the 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 fetters on innovation although there are periods when capitalism speeds it up um because it gets to a certain point of devaluation um are extraordinary really when you think about it because when when it's not profitable to invest they stop investing and that's that curtails production it curtails innovation it curtails research you know Amer- uh, the US has there's there's hardly any private R and D uh, in the US anymore. It's it's most almost entirely done by the state um, because it's it's just become unaffordable for for private R and D. Um, and then I think the big one is fossil fuel. Um, like capitalism has been very dependent on fossil fuel um, because of its non renewability and its finiteness. You know, it's it's labor intensive to like traditionally it's labor intensive to produce, um, and because it disappears into thin air, it's non renewable, and therefore you have to hire labor to reproduce it again, you, to dig it up from the ground again, um, and that's why that's why fossil fuels been so important to Captain. But as we know, most of the good fossil fuel has been has been um, dug up now. And it's becoming harder and harder to to produce fossil fuel efficiently. It's becoming very expensive to to produce this same amount of fossil fuel than it was in the past, just because the you know they're they're they're, they're essentially running dry 
and um, most of what they bring up is water um, and there's very little fossil fuel contained in it and so it's quite expensive to process what they do bring up as well um, obviously they are in a, they are trying to innovate to improve that and they might manage that a little bit but the i think the um, energy return on investment has fallen from on fossil fuel has fallen from 100 to 1 in 1930 to estimates are, are, are around between three and six to one now and anything below three to one is considered uneconomic like they won't that won't be invested in It'll, so that so that that industry is winding down that um and it's so indebted as well um it's just not it's just not profitable it's not efficient and it's coming coming up against its absolute limits and as i say fossil fuel has been so important to, to capitalism it's in in the last century anyway without it, it i don't see how it can go on um at, you know maybe it could go on a, on a much smaller capacity but then that would leave the vast majority of people unemployed uh, and so on and so forth yeah it's interesting the way in which different ideas of kind of materialism come in especially that in the ways that they work with grossman's thought so well is that it you know it isn't necessarily that an idea of a final crisis needs to come from the lack of available surplus value that is in the market or lack of available places to get it it is also just I mean, obviously, with climate, something as simple as we're running out of frontiers in terms of fossil fuels and, you know, all of mm-hmm. these things kind of happening all at once. Exactly. I, I've, it's very it's incredible how it all seems to be converging at the same time. It's 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 quite humbling, really. It is. It definitely yeah. is. I mean, in your in your book, Socialism or Extinction, the subtitle mentions climate, automation and war. Um, and so we've definitely, we've touched on automation a bit, and I don't think anyone who listens to this show needs any more doom in their lives about the climate. But when it comes to war, I'm interested to kind of hear how that plays into a final crisis, because oftentimes when you read Marxists from, say, like the 20th century, they really talk a lot about how World War One and World War II were like opportunities for um, capital to be de- devalued sufficiently for the rate of profit to kind of come back in sufficient force. Um, I was inter- I'm interested to know if you think that if such a thing is possible anymore, or if these kind of proxy wars that we see going on fill a similar function, or if, you know, because I've, I've heard Marxists say that the bourgeoisie wouldn't ever um, risk a nuclear war. And I've heard Marxists say there's going to be a nuclear war tomorrow, right? So I'm interested to kind of know where your <laughs> research has led you. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't, again, I kind of try and think of it in terms of a dual movement um absolutely a war can accelerate the devaluation of capital just through the destruction of it and therefore create new opportunities for profitable investment um uh war can devalue labor power like very rapidly um which makes it then makes labor um cheaper to hire and more exploitable um at the same time though a war will um accelerate the tendency to innovate um because of the arms race and that means accelerating the tendency towards automation um and yeah that so that works in the opposite direction um and that can ultimately speed up the onset of the next crisis or the onset of a final crisis if that's where we are heading um on nuclear war you know yeah it's it's just it's it's unanswerable whether we could recover from that or whether you know part of the world would have to recover from it or 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 whatnot i don't know would would they risk it there there's talk of these there's talk of limited uh nuclear arms being used and stuff like that and again there's a a debate whether that's you know just amounts to the same thing ultimately because that you could it could easily lead to a situation with multiple countries firing them off and that sort of thing so just a small nuclear war is a treat to restore profitability just a little one (laughs) 
Well, the US um, released um, a doctrine a couple of years ago that said that it could um, restore stability, a nuclear war could restore stability, by which they meant... <laughs> By which they meant could, you know, see off some of our competition from China and that sort of thing, <laughs> I guess. Um, it, I, I, you know, it might have been a blag to to get people, you know, certain rivals to back down. But if it wasn't, it's obviously unhinged. That is one word for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think maybe... I'm thinking about where to go next because I think that there is there is kind of there does seem to be a a grain of thought that runs through all of this that the um, that history is tending towards hopefully with an upgraded um, production system um, greater more abundant material wealth for yeah. not you know not just certain sectors of the working class but for hopefully for everybody. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm wondering, at least when it when it comes to socialism and a potential transition, a lot of thought is going to have to be put into kind of where that is set at. And obviously that opens up a whole can of worms for like who's mm. deciding what it means to have abundant material wealth, who is deciding what it means to, um, how can you decide that democratically? Obviously resources aren't distributed evenly across the world or power relations, even in some sort of transitory um, mode of production, you would imagine. But um I'm wondering kind of where on the kind of spectrum of say like maybe your 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 Jack Kamats and your kind of like anarcho primitivist returns to on the other end of the spectrum maybe like your fully automated luxury communism everybody kind of can have everything have a computer a tablet and that's kind of like an unfair uh, uh, stereotype of them but like where where is it that socialism you would see could set this boundary of abundant material wealth while still being able to maintain a balance in terms of our ecology, because it's very yeah. easy to say everybody can have an infinity pool, everybody can have whatever they want, but realistically, like, is that actually the case? Because for a lot of 20th century socialism, a lot of the promise has been just have whatever you want, you know, you do some work, four hours a day, whatever, you can have whatever you want, but I think maybe now we're realizing, you know, perhaps that's not actually true. So I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I would just add on to what I was saying about there being a bit of a continuation with the wage. Like, you still have to earn what you're going to purchase, at least in the early stages of of socialism. I don't know, like, hundreds of years into the future what socialism or communism is going to look like. But obviously, so we're going to inherit a situation of collapse and crisis and... We we will we will essentially be re, rebuilding civilization potentially, and you know from scratch, but with the technology we've inherited, right? Um, and as you but as you say, we need to do that without turbocharging the climate crisis, um, without destroying the soil, um, and so on and so forth. And so, what we need to do is as I argue um, in my book, is wind down. So so, so let's say we've had a, re- a revolution and we've taken everything, including fossil fuel, under public ownership. What do we do? Well, we need to get off of fossil fuel as quickly as possible, but we also need to be making sure everyone's fed, um, everyone's got housing, and that living standards are rising. So that's that's the difficult balance. And obviously we're, we're going to have to think that through very carefully. A lot of planning will need to go, go into it. And, but, but essentially you're going to have to build up alternative industries while you're winding down fossil fuel. Because if you, if you just say we're going to limit fossil fuel very harshly while we're doing that, and I think we should limit, limit as much as we can. But if we, if we, if we, just say right we're not using fossil fuel we're just going to build up the other um the other alternative clean uh energy systems um and you're just going to have to wait until that's you know built up enough before things start to get better i think that will inspire rebellion and 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 make things worse um so you're going to have to we're going to have to judge um quite carefully how to 
to wind down the use of fossil fuel, what's left of it, whilst building up the new industries such such as renewables. Um, but again, even mining, I, I think I think my, metal mining will take longer to wind down. But uh, because it's already like with solar and wind power, we're we're already doing extraordinary amounts of of metal mining. And although they they are highly pollutive, they're nowhere near as bad as fossil fuel um, ultimately. So we probably will have to put up with some of the the mining practices that we have at the moment. But I think in the long run, we can replace. Uh, we put from from my understanding, you know, of reading of of the technological developments that are coming uh, coming to fruition. Um, we can probably replace metal mining with things like, um, so in my book, I talk about hemp um, having a very sort of versatile and prolific um, capacities for production, such as supercapacitors, which apparently are more efficient than, than lithium. Um, you can replace all sorts of plastics with with hemp bioplastic and plastics from other um, fibrous plants there's also um, the mycelium revolution is something that's being talked about where you can sort of coax uh, mycelium which is a type of fungi into all sorts of shapes and structures um, there's talk about microbial fuel cells um, potentially as a replacement for um, high high uh, sort of um, like energy that energy that needs a lot where well, you need a lot of energy for sort of highly intensive um, forms of production or consumption. Um, there's space based solar is a, is a potential um, option where you're collecting sunshine in space and then uh, redirecting that energy back down onto earth whereas at the moment we have the problem with intermittency from solar where like in somewhere like, like germany where they've um where they've curtailed the the amount of nuclear they're using the backup to solar is now coming from coal which is having two effects one it's making the energy grid dirtier and it's contributing to an increase in energy poverty. Um, so there you can see where the fossil fuel industry is still quite powerful. Um, it's managing to redirect subsidies away from nuclear. I mean, nu nuclear is also suffering from the overaccumulation of capital just within the industry sort of thing, because nuclear is inherently cap capital intensive. Uh, very very highly capital intensive so it's not that profitable to to keep privately and even the the option france has long pursued with having it publicly owned that still has to be paid for out of private profits um because profits are collected out of surplus value that could otherwise be dedicated to to the the private sector so and then there's nuclear fusion, but how how long is it going to take to get to that point? Um, but generally, we are moving in the direction of of additive production, which is things like things that we can grow, um, or and not just in the ground, but in labs. Um, so we can actually um, produce gold in the labs now like through synthetic uh, chemistry that is purer than the gold that you'll find in the ground so if you can do that i don't see why you can't do that with other metals uh, maybe i'm wrong on that but but there seems to be a lot of options for 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 um um replacing fossil fuel and metals and it's just a case of you know of, of what we usually hear from liberals is it's just a case of political will, but it's not that it's it's I mean, partially it's that, but it's um, because they're invested interests, of course, uh, with the owners of the, of the fossil fuel and the mining industries. But it's economics. It's, you know, these industries are profitable for those people. They want to keep making profits out of them.
and they will keep investing in what's profitable while it's while it's profitable. Um, f- fossil fuels have become less profitable in the last decade, and that's why we've started to see a, a bigger turn towards um, solar and and wind um, because capitalists need to expand production they need to expand what they're producing um but but yeah it, it, like if if we could flick a switch and have everything publicly owned we could speed up this transition massively and we would have a much better shot at you know saving the environment before it's too late yeah and i it, a lot of that makes me think about just the ways in which a socialist revolution is the only way to like actually um release like you know what we are told about like the creative potentials of humanity and really actually being able to do research into these things like the mycelium revolution or something like that which you would never get investment in until if ever until it's way too late um kind of on on that dan i know that before this we were talking about like what a potential transition would look like and if it kind of requires um some sort of crisis or transition um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I suppose that was motivated by a few things. I read in one of your um, essays that I was looking at, you were talking about like a tendency toward um, state monopoly capitalism transitioning into like a sort of socialist monopoly. Um, and I, I had some queries about sort of how that process might happen. Um, but more generally in regards to what Jack was just saying, like um, I guess it feels like we're looking to a process which motivates the working class through their remiseration by capitalism. Do you think that's the best way to sort of consider how the working class is mobilized to um, make that transition, I guess? Yeah. So again, I kind of think of it as a dual movement where breakdown also um, compels revolution. Um, So the breakdown of living standards which would include at some point the capitalist state's inability to pay most of its staff, whether those that civil service or soldiers or what have you, which then puts the you know the system in in a real political crisis. What I mean by um, so state monopoly capitalism first first of all, what I mean by that is capital and uh, private enterprise being increasingly dependent on the state for subsidies um, and contracts and things like that. And, and obviously there's this tendency towards monopoly where every industry is becoming dominated by fewer and fewer competitors. So that's, that's the ex- explanation why, for why I call it state monopoly capitalism. And why I think that has laid, because again, I think if I, I think of I think about things in small evolutionary steps. So, like I said, revolution is a small step relative to all these sort of small again small steps that have become before during the course of of capitalism's history. And so, I I I think it's a mistake to leap too far ahead of where we are, which is state monopoly capitalism so i think it makes sense that the next phase is state monopoly socialism so um so so yeah you have this um tendency towards monopolization so that indicates to me that there must be this sort of movement towards a, what i call a final merger of of the remaining monopolies so if you just look at something like the banking industry like 30 years ago there were like 30 big banks in the US and now there's like four because they've all either merged together or the remaining four have bought up the the other ones when they went bankrupt and and that sort of thing so that indicates that we're pretty close towards a final merger at least in the banking industry and the dependence on the central bank now uh to intervene to bail to bail out um the private the remaining private enterprise uh to print money um to sort of 
try and get cash flow going and um, to speed up the circulation of, of money and, and everything. Um, and even when you look at um, private enterprises within private enterprise, they're increasingly planned like on a scientific level. So the data science revolution, um, one of the things um, that they all uh, sort of um, propound is the use of a central database because um, that enables every sort of out, outer part of of a company to have access to the same data so that it boosts the efficiency of of each company and their production um, so obviously we've always talked about socialism being a century planned economy again it's just a step on from what, where we already are um, Again, with the central bank, that's another example of central planning. Or if it's the government allocating resources from one part of the economy to the other. Uh, and that's increasingly the case in terms of um, subsidising capital. Um, so, again, it's just it seems to me that there's just this sort of evolutionary movement towards this. Um, the workforce is almost entirely services based um, now so we and we talked a little bit about that in terms of automation so um, commodity production is becoming basically unviable because the, the working class is no longer producing commodities and so that indicates a move towards socialism and then money becoming increasingly valueless really like we've seen this massive exponential rise in uh, money creation i know they're trying to curtail that now but like they've only curtailed what went before a little bit and we're already having these major problems with inflation and supply chain breakdowns um so and that that's with a rise of a quite a small I mean, it's not a small rise but the the interest the baseline interest rate has gone up to like four percent uh the quickest uh rate that that's ever happened but it's already caused these major problems and i don't really mean it's caused it because the the rate the rise in interest rates itself is a symptom of of the crisis um where they're saying they've sort of got to the point where they're saying we're gonna have to let this part of the economy or the, these companies go bust um, so that the other companies that survive can sort of thrive by sort of um, sort of living off the, the corpses I, that are left behind. Which I guess is further in that tendency toward monopoly, right? Where exactly. You, like, yeah, exactly. Like the, 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 the Something else that I got from one of your pieces was this, this policy by government to increase interest rates to induce a recession to sort of have some other companies go bust but to funnel wealth to a smaller number of capitalists and capitalist firms is that yeah so, so, so both yeah so both options can con can do can can help accumulation and hinder it but you need to hinder accumulation at some points to to be able to help it at a latter point so in 2019 like growth had basically uh, ground ground to a to a halt and um, so they went back to zero interest rates having so so after 2008 they went to zero interest rates for seven years which was like they'd never even gone to zero before let alone for seven years and this was to cheapen capital to make it easier to access so that it was easier to invest it and so on and so forth but then it's already at zero come 2019 and the economy isn't growing so they stopped um that like there was no point of making capital uh making capital so cheap at that point so interest rates start to go up but then at um about two and a half percent like the like the recession started and like the political mood and the economic mood was so and obviously then there was the pandemic and so the so they went back down to zero to try and uh, 
basically, I think they were trying to on to delay the onset of the crash because they knew how bad it could get, and obviously they'll want a managed decline because politically and socially, the the harder and deeper a crash is, and quicker the, that crash sort of manifests, the the more difficult it is going to be to handle politically. Um, so yeah, but now they've had to, they've just had to raise the interest rates and and not really to tackle inflation, but to improve profitability. The problem with inflation is that it's making it expensive for companies to purchase the components and the parts they need to to carry on with production, essentially. And it's, I mean, it's there's it's sort of making wages more expensive in in one sense and cheaper in another sense, but that that sort of depends on whether you're measuring absolutely or relatively um so yeah money becoming valueless becoming more and more valueless as it expands because of course money is also a commodity the more it expands the more each unit of money is devalued just like any other commodity um so yeah that's basically the gist of why i talk about sort of an evolution or a transition as well as a revolution i'm not denying that the transition will be revolutionary that it will take a class struggle and all the rest of it but what i'm saying is that will be induced by this sort of evolution of the economic technical base where the the economic side is almost like withering away leaving the technical side or Again, the the use value side is withering. Uh, sorry, the the use value side is is becoming so dominant that the ex, the exchange value side is is withering away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Jack and I have done a lot of talking about um, history and the sort of process of change and whether it's done whether to fixate or focus on like continuity or change and when to see. Um, I guess how much continuity there is in otherwise like revolutionary process. So that sort of mm. like description that you've just given, I think appeals to me quite a lot or appeals to us and that thinking of like, um, yeah, because otherwise you get into this magical realm of just like, well, like, um, we'll yeah. have some tomorrow kind of thing. And really, yeah, just... so these questions of like, okay, will it uh, labor? T- we've talked a bit, a little bit like labor, labor tokens and that process of like moving to, uh, it's maybe like a labor token system as sort of being somewhat analogous to what we have now, but different enough in fundamental enough ways that as yeah. it, you can transition from producing to, to um, focusing uh, on producing use values, for example. Yeah, exactly. just, you know, whatever. And they're already talking about these NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens, because they're trying to compete. They're trying to centralize the um, cryptocurrency um, industry. Mm-hmm. So the, there's already, the system's already mostly in place or it's it's soon will be um obviously there will be work to do technically on how labor tokens will be measured and all the rest and weighted and all the rest of it but the fact that we're already there and there's some meme going around on twitter about how marx predicted nfts in (laughs) chapter 15 of volume one or whatever it was i can't remember um so it is remarkable again it's it's just quite humbling to see this sort of process unfolding and yeah like you say um that's the best way of thinking about it is this sort of process oriented sort of this dual movement sort of towards breakdown but also towards transition at the same time um it's never one or the other um it's 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 really important to try not to separate things out too much i can i just ask one thing on uh, going off of that, um, Dan and I have also kind of done quite a bit of discussion when it comes to history on the ways in which interclass, yeah, interclass conflict plays a role in the development of modes of production, specifically in the ruling class. And so I'm wondering when you talk about these policies around centralizing and monopoly, um, what effect that has on the cohesion of the capitalist class as a whole? Because we know that even in the best of times, there are interests that are can be completely opposite of one another. So I'm wondering where you see, or even if you see a kind of core contradiction within the capitalist class that is developing along with this tendency kind of towards crisis. Yeah, so obviously when there's, when you get the overaccumulation of capital or an underproduction of surplus value, competition over allocations of that surplus value intensify. Um, 
So one simple example is how um, probably investors in um, fossil fuel might deny the climate crisis because they don't want to see state subsidies being redirected into renewables instead of fossil fuels. Um, obviously, there's quite a lot of realisation within the ruling class now that there does need to be a change. And, and that itself is um, driven by like the fact that they know fossil fuel is on the way that on the way out um, historically, just because it's it's literally running dry. Um, but I think probably some of the smaller investors who don't make as much money out of it are probably the ones who tend to deny the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, they're just desperate to keep... It's, it's partly because they're a bit poorer, I think. They're, they're a little bit more desperate. It's, it's harder for them to reproduce their own personal wealth um that sort of thing and they can they can feel themselves being edged out so i think the main i think a lot of the divisions in the work in the ruling class are over innovation so you see a kind of um you do see a kind of anti innovation trend developing within some sections of the capitalist class like the I don't know, it's really difficult to judge because like the the right libertarian I'm talking about sort of right libertarians. Um they seem to be getting a lot of the time to me, they seem to be getting edged out by like the Bill Gateses and the the um the Jeff uh, Bezoses of the world. But then someone like Elon Musk seems to be on that fringe of the sort of right libertarian fringe, and he seems to be sort of supplanting potentially supplanting someone like bill gates it's very fluid and complex and it's hard to really like separate them out into different sort of absolute sections but yeah there's kind of that gist like obviously if someone comes along with an innovation that's going to make your industry or your product redundant you're going to want to resist that and that that can obviously manifest in all sorts of ways. Um, I watched a documentary about uh, what was it? It was something to do with um, it was it was a it was an innovative way of of farming and um, producing food. Um, I don't know if it was permaculture or or something like that, but they it they they're their factory or whatever it was, was burnt down. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So assuming that that wasn't like a false flag or something. <laughs> <laughs> Permaculture false flags. I've been saying it for years. Um, then that was, you know, that was done by, by some rival who fears this new innovation making them redundant. And there's, um, there's precision fermentation that I've talked a bit about. Um, which is set i mean there's there's a few there's research uh, what are they called rethink x have written about it and george monbio i don't know if i said his surname right who writes for the guy and he's written about it and they've written about it making conventional farming obsolete within the next two decades so obviously there's a lot of farmers who are who are uh really going to want to resist that new technology so it yeah it can be competition over subsidies it can be you know competition over different forms of technology and 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 all sorts of things really but that that is obviously a very worrying possibility just you know forget what the working class might do just the sort of the the rivalries between capitalists are um worrying enough yeah not that i'm worried about the working class but just <laughs> in terms of what we're getting in terms of what's going to happen in the future which you know isn't ideal we, we would rather a, a very smooth very peaceful transition but um because of the different interests at stake and just how complex the world is and it, it, increasingly so um it probably won't be an extremely smooth extremely peaceful process yeah 
Absolutely. I think I'm, I'm also interested in knowing that in this move towards crisis, cyclical and kind of final crises as well, the movement away from kind of productive capital that a lot of the capitalist class faces and movement into more like safe things like financialization or just purely rents. Um, and any yeah. of your research, have you found that that's created a dynamic where there is perhaps a split within the capitalist class? Um, I mean, there is, yeah, there is. Um, but there's also the kind of tendency for productive capital to basically take over like, um, the unproductive sides. So if you're a capitalist and you rent a factory, you're going to want to buy that factory so that you don't have to rent it. Um, and yeah, just sort of, if you extrapolate from that, that that's been a struggle throughout capitalism. You know, Ricardo and Smith were on the side of the productive capitalists and they saw the feudal landlord as a parasite on productive capital. So they, they were taking part in a struggle against that side of the ruling class. Um, and like with a lot of the time people see the banks as like the most um the sort of the most powerful institutions but it i really don't agree with that at all um the the banks are being part of the reason the banking industry is becoming so centralized is because it's been taken over by industrial capital more and more and and the the industrialists are, are increasingly self-financing you know, Apple sits, a company like Apple sit, sits on massive reserves, which is obviously as a, a symptom of overaccumulation. They've got nothing to invest it in, but it also means they can be self-financing. Um, so, yeah, this, this sort of notion held by sometimes by social Democrats, but also largely by right wing libertarians and, and other right wingers that the banks are controlling everything is just not not the case and maybe that's because maybe that's partly because they have investments in in industry and they want to they want less money going towards banks and that sort of thing as well yeah absolutely well i mean dan i don't know if you have anything else but we don't need to waste any more of your time i don't think unless there's anything else you have to say <laughs> you're not wasting it but i do need to go and eat <laughs> <laughs> well that's fair you should probably eat it's been a it's been a great pleasure Ted. thanks for coming on um yeah it's been a really great conversation a pleasure as well to speak to both of you thanks very much uh, for your challenging questions and i uh, hope we can do it again sometime in the future music you heard this episode was music to kill bad people to by king gizzard and the lizard wizard if you like this song you can check it out and much much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com be sure and follow us up on instagram twitter and facebook and if you like what you heard be sure and tune in next week for some more commie discussion till next time